joining Time Out with PSOA, where sports officials share their stories to help recruit, train, educate not only sports officials, but players, coaches, administrators, and fans. Through this information, we're going to help make us all better for the game. Thank you for taking time out with PSOA. Today's podcast, we're going to focus on football fouls explained. There's going to be a lot of information, and the purpose of this information is to give clarity to officials, to players, to coaches, to fans, to administrators of the intent and purpose of the rule, of the foul. Sometimes the foul is there for safety. Other times the foul is there for fairness. So our threshold as football officials of what is and is not a foul will change based on the type of foul and the intent of the foul for it to be in the rule book. And the last really main reason is to understand all the steps, all the processes football officials have to take into consideration to call a foul. If I were to go out and watch a game and then grade the game via film, black and white officiating, you could probably find 50 fouls every single football game. Our goal as a high school official, our goal as a college football official is to call the fouls that impact the game. We don't want to bring any more attention to ourselves as a football official calling every single foul we see, but we have to see every foul we call and we have to know what impact did that foul have on the game when it comes to fairness and safety. So let's get it started. The most common foul called in all of football is false start. And what we hear majority of the time from the, especially the defensive players, fans, coaches, they moved, they moved, throw the flag. They moved. All right. What is a false start? A false start is a movement that simulates the start of the play. So can the offensive players move? Absolutely. All right. Tight ends that are uncovered could stand up, go to the backfield, motion on over, come back to the line of scrimmage, come back down to three-point stance. That's a lot of movement, but all that movement did not simulate the start of the snap. Can the quarterback throw their hands forward in their cadence? Can they say really, really loud? Yes, they can. But that movement does not simulate the start of the snap. Can the center turn their head back and forth to make sure their linemen are, are ready and set before they snap the ball? Can any lineman point to who they're going to block? Yes, they can, as long as it does not simulate the start of the play. So what are officials looking for to throw the flag on a false start? They're looking for a receiver starting the route. Those are the easy ones. Boom, you have the wide receiver. The cadence is on two. They start moving forward on the first hike cadence. Easy. They look for a lineman coming out of their stance. So once they have one hand down in a three-point stance, if they come up out of their stance before the snap, that's simulating starting the play because they're now looking to block. We're looking for quick jerk motion. All right, so if there's an offensive lineman, they have their left hand down and their right hand does a quick jerk motion backwards, or a quarterback does a quick jerk motion with their head bob, what we are now looking there is for a defensive reaction because not everybody's going to see that quick jerk motion. And if nobody sees it, including the defense, did it simulate the start of the play? And the official's answer is no. So if you have a quick jerk motion, another one is a flinch. We are now looking for the defense to react 
because when the defense reacts to that quick jerk motion or flinch, now that's telling us as officials that movement simulated the start of the play. So false start, by far the, the most called foul that we have as sports officials is when the offense makes a movement that simulates start of the play, and we will tell you, fans, coaches, officials, if there is not any proof that that movement simulated the start of the play, do not throw a foul, do not throw your flag for false start. The next called foul is encroachment, is what we call it in high school, what you hear on TV with NCAA football and NFL football is offside. This is now when the defense comes into the neutral zone or beyond the neutral zone before the ball is snapped. So we're going to start with the high school. In high school, when encroachment foul is called, the ball is dead and it will remain dead the whole entire time. So there is no quote-unquote free play for encroachment in high school football. So we have a lineman. Their helmet is barely touching the football. That's what we call tight to the line of scrimmage. Any forward movement in is going to put that defense into the neutral zone. High school, dead, ball, foul, throw your flag. Where we have the threshold now, though, it's first and 10. There is no tight formation. So now the, the defensive helmet, let's say, is a half yard back away from the football. If that defensive player moves forward, that forward movement does not put them in a neutral zone. Now we officials, we're looking for that helmet to go beyond the football because it was not a tight play. They're, they don't have eight defenders in the box. All right, so our threshold is different when it's fourth and one or fourth and goal and everybody's tight versus first and 10, second and 15 when the linemen are not tight. Um, but in high school football, if the defense goes into the neutral zone or beyond that football, we're going to throw the flag for encroachment. Differences in college and pro is if there's no contact – if there's not an offensive reaction, and if that defender is not in the backfield unabated to a back, we now allow that offense to snap the ball and get a free play. So now that dead ball is allowed to become a live ball, and that offense could throw a very long pass for a touchdown. And if it's intercepted, that's okay. We come back and enforce the offside. Um, the, the rule difference there is because the team that fouled was a defense. So if the offense is not put at a disadvantage because the defense um, jumped into the neutral zone before the snap, we want to allow the offense um, to gain an advantage on the play. So that's encroachment and, and offside in college and pro. And again, the, the different threshold that co comes into our mind is where does the defense start? Um, that's our threshold. The fun one, offensive holding. And to really understand offensive holding, we have to take a look at two rules. Um, the first one is in definitions. When blocking, it is legal to close and cup your hands as so long as the elbows are inside of the shoulders. Okay, so uh, we, we always talk about there's holding on every single play. Not really, because it is legal to close your hands and keep your elbows inside the shoulders of your body frame. It's also legal to have open hand technique. And open hand technique is our hands are open, we're outside our body frame, but we are guiding that player where they can and can't go. So if I am open hand pushing away and that d defensive back or linebacker is trying to get back in the middle, but with my open hand, I'm preventing them from doing that. 
it's completely legal. Um, so always start with when, when I come to holding, hey, coach, was it closed cup or was it open hand? And, and that usually makes that coach think, all right, I don't know. All right, I had a closed cup, but I had the elbows inside the body frame. Okay, so now we have that rule to explain to the coach why it was not a holding foul. And then the next part of the holding foul is rule nine. And this is where we talk about we have to put holding fouls into categories or buckets. And if we can't put a hold in a category or bucket, we can't throw a flag um, as an official. So illegal use of hands and holding, grasping or encircling, hooking, locking, clamping, restraining an opponent. All right, so the, the simple categories that we make that rule into application is grab and restrict. So, yes, we have a closed cup, and now we restrict our opponent because now they are outside the elbow and outside our body frame. Hook and turn. So we grab the upper shoulder pad or the upper um, arm of the jersey. Not only did we close cup it, we turned the opponent. The encircling, or we tackle the opponent. The takedown, so we grab and throw the opponent down. And then the grab and jerk. So the grab and jerk, we look for two things. One, close grip, and they jerk them down. So not necessarily do they take them down to the ground, but they grab them and they jerk them down um, so we could get to the next block. Or the grab and jerk is we dip their shoulders. So we, we take away their balance, we take away their feet as an offensive lineman. So... Is there holding on every play? I would argue no, because a lot of the closed grip cup, their elbows are in a good place and they stay within the shoulder frame. And there is a lot of restraint, but we can legally restrain with an open hand. Now, we get the argument. That flag was so late. Why did the official take so long to throw that holding flag real simple once we have the bucket once we have that category we have a what i call a potential now for a foul going back to the uh, the podcast our goal as officials is to call the fouls that impact the game and we could probably find 50 holds in a game legit but we now have to take into consideration, got the category, got the bucket. What was the impact of that hold on my opponent? If my opponent had absolutely no bearing on that play to make a tackle or go and prevent a tackle, it is not a foul. That's when I'm going to go up to the offensive lineman and say, 77, had that ball carrier went to your gap that was holding. Since the ball carrier went away from your gap on the other side of the field, that's why there was no flag. Another good person to hear that conversation is the person that was grabbed and restricted. Now they know, all right, the official has my back. If it happens when I'm trying to make a tackle, that official is going to call that a holding foul. The other item we're looking for is... Um, the overall effect uh, on the game. Um, I, I hate to really go into great detail on this, but when we talk about time and score, we have to be part of the, the fairness of the game, the flow of the game. So if we have a third string offensive lineman in there against the first string defensive end, and it's a 35 point uh, mercy and the clock is running, let's use that time to teach that lineman what is and is not offensive holding. Um, we shouldn't have to stop the game, bring attention to it, because um, believe it or not, there is a lot of uh, psychological cognitive effect of a foul on a player. So if we could help educate the player what the rule is, help educate the player what the threshold is, prevent attention from the whole situation, 
more than likely that player is going to respect that, understand it, and improve. Um, if we do choose that, yep, we have a holding. It impacted the play, but on the overall aspect of the game, I don't have to throw the flag. Let the coach know. Let both coaches know. Coach, we saw it. We passed on it because of this situation. We've communicated the foul to both players, to both coaches. Um, it will go far away uh, of credibility and uh, earning trust in future content contests defensive pass interference the acronym we use is d p i first we also first we got to start with the rule the first thing people forget defensive pass interference starts after a legal forward pass is made all right so the defense can legally go up to a receiver and block them. Um, a defense, defensive back could legally go up to a receiver with open hands, two-hand push them. That is not pass interference because the ball's not in the air yet. Defensive pass interference does not start until after a legal forward pass has been thrown. And just like um, holding, we have categories and buckets. So we have to process as officials. All right, what are we looking for? Um, Here's the buckets we're looking for. We're looking for the grab and restrict. Not only a jersey tug. That jersey tug is the grab. A jersey tug is not the foul. The restrict is, does it take speed, rhythm, balance away from the the opponent? All right, so grab and restrict. Jersey tug, that slows down the receiver to go towards that pass. Now we have a foul. We have hook and turn. Once again, I grab the outside side shoulder and I turn them away from going towards that pass to go catch it. Early contact, not playing the ball. Remember, we can contact each other early. But if I, as a defender, am not playing the ball, that's what makes it pass interference, not playing the ball. This was a rule change a few years back. Face guarding is legal, all right? Yeah, we're not playing the ball, but, again, that second part of the foul, early contact. So if I'm face guarding and I have my hands over the receiver's face and my arms up in the air, but if I don't make contact with that receiver... It's not a foul. So both components are needed. Early contact and not playing the ball. This is a hard one. Playing through the back. Um, And and when I say it's a hard one, because when we get into contact that's legal, um, we have to compare the bang-bang theory versus the grandma in the top row saw that defender make, make that contact in the back before that ball arrived. If we have to slow it down, slow motion replay to see that that defender hit the receiver first before the ball got there, that's not big enough for pass interference. And coach, we're going to call it the same way when your defense is out there. Offensive pass interference, OPI. Similar categories, similar threshold, little bit different rules. All right, so offensive pass interference, those restrictions start after the snap. And when we mean by after the snap, you have three receivers or trips to one side of the field. We're in the red zone. We as officials are now thinking, all right, these receivers are going to run routes to either confuse the defense or have the defense run into each other or have the defense run into my teammate. That's what we call pick play. Um, So if we have trips, if you're in red zone, officials, we call this red red flags antennas, we need to know how those receivers run their routes. Because right after the snap, if the offense initiates contact with the defense, which allows my teammate to get open for a pass, even if it's before the pass, We have offensive pass interference for a pick play. 
as defensive pass interference, we're looking for categories, very similar categories, with the exception of of the the pick play. We're looking for the grab and restrict. So, yep, we're blocking each other, but then now I restrict the defender to go towards that pass because it's a bad pass. I can't restrict that defender to go intercept the pass the same way the defender can't restrict the offensive player to go towards the pass. Um, OPI of creating separation. There's a difference between creating and keeping, but if the offense pushes off and create separation so that are the only one that are, that are able to catch the pass, we have offensive pass interference. Early contact, not playing the ball, same exact category, same exact threshold um, for the offense. They cannot contact the defender who's going to make the interception um, without playing the ball. The next part of OPI, offensive pass interference, and DPI, defensive pass interference. In my mind, as an official, I always want to start with the contact being legal. The players have to show me that the contact turned illegal. So it's one of those, we are innocent until proven guilty when it comes to OPI and DPI because this is actually a fairness foul. So the intent of this foul is you don't want one receiver, eligible receiver, to gain an advantage over another eligible receiver. So the threshold to me is exactly the same. If I'm not going to call a lot of offensive pass interference fouls, I don't want to call a lot of defensive pass interference fouls. So it always starts legal. If both players make a bona fide effort toward the ball, I have four hands going to the catch. I'm not going to have pass interference. Will I have early contact? Absolutely. I'm going to have shoulder to shoulder. I'm going to have hip to hip. I might even have chest on helmet going for the ball. But if I have both players make an early contact, both going for the ball, a.k.a. Hail Mary at the end of the game, I have no foul. Bang, bang. So I'm going to clap my hands there. It's a clear two claps. And you will also hear the thud of the equipment, the thud of the ball hitting the hand. But if it's close, bang, bang, we got nothing. All right. It, it is very difficult as an athlete to truly, truly time up pass touched versus contacting my opponent. So both ways, offensive and defensive. If it's bang, bang, I hear two sounds, but they're very, very close to each other. Coach, I have bang, bang. I have simultaneous contact with ball and opponent. Legal contact. We talk about the face guarding. It is legal to put your hands, put up your arms, block the vision of the receiver trying to catch the ball. As long as there's no contact, they have to clearly contact that player for me to call pass interference. If we have hand fighting, literally open hands, boop, 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 hand fighting, they're, they're, they're just hitting each other's hands. There's no grabbing. There's no restricting. There's no hooking of the arms. They're literally hand fighting. That contact is legal. That is not a foul. Now, if that hand fighting turns into a grab or I'm going to use my arm to restrict my opponent's arm from coming up, now we have a foul. But hand fighting is not a foul. Just as ball carriers could stiff arm, receivers could keep their arm out, straight arm, and keep separation from the opponent. Because now all they're doing is they are using their body, which is legal, to keep the receiver from getting close to my body. All right, so keeping separation, having that straight arm, stiff arming, is legal. Now you can't bend it back towards your body, and push off. That's what makes it a foul. But keeping separation is legal. And the one that gets the crowd really, really excited, and it gets excited because they only see the very end of the play when the ball is coming down towards the receivers. We see two receivers, offensive uh, receiver, and we have the defensive backer safety. They're running side by side, and all of a sudden, boom, both of them fall. 
or all of a sudden only the offensive receiver falls or all of, all of a sudden only the defensive player falls. What happened there was feet got tangled up. They call it feet tangle, untangle. And this is where officials will be booed and criticized. But as a back judge or as a deep official or as a linesman going downfield and watching our key, our receivers the whole entire time, you're going to see their feet hit each other. And they, without lack of better terms, they trip over each other's feet. That is nothing. That is completely legal. It's incidental contact. Um, so that's a really good explanation of offensive and defensive pass interference. Again, when it comes to the ones we have covered thus far, false start, encroachment slash offside, holding, defensive pass interference, offensive pass interference. They are all fairness fouls. Have it impact the play, have it impact the game, have the courage to call it when we need to call it, have the wherewithal not to call it when a game doesn't need it to be called. Now we're going to move into the um, safety fouls. First one is block in the back. All right. People connect this block in the back to, to a safety or to a fairness foul. But really, a block in the back will lead us into blindside block, but they don't see the block coming. And if you push them hard enough in the back, you're going to see the whiplash of the neck. All right, so it's the most overcalled foul with new officials. Um, but for it to be a foul for block in the back, we need to have contact inside the shoulder blades of the opponent. If one hand is on the side, one hand is in the back, that is considered a side block as long as that the contact is more directed from the side instead of straight back. Make the blocks in the backs huge, but it is a safety foul. We, we don't want a player whiplashed with their neck um, falling face forward with their face mask down to the ground. Formations, all right? Um, this is a fairness foul. In high school, in college, in NFL, we're allowed four backs in the backfield. And there's a lot of differences we must understand as officials and coaches understand what we're looking for. First off, we want a, uh, the receivers to be clearly separated, as in one is on the line of scrimmage, one is in the backfield. But if we have two receivers who are near, their feet are near each other, they both, quote-unquote, look like they're on the line of scrimmage, but there's only three other backs in the backfield, we're going to use the blade of grass theory. I see a blade of grass between those two receivers' feet, so that inside receiver, I'm putting them in the backfield to make it four in the backfield. So wide receivers, we're going to use blade of grass. Tight ends, we're not. If we have a receiver making it difficult for the defense to see if the, that tight end is covered or uncovered, eligible receiver, ineligible receiver, I am covering up that tight end. Um, so officials, if they want the tight end to be an eligible receiver, that outside receiver clearly has to be a half yard, if not a yard off of the line of scrimmage. So the defense knows that tight end is an eligible receiver. And then any trick play, um, whether it be swinging gate, um, whether it be um, a fake punt, we need to make sure the formation is legal and there are clearly four receivers in the backfield and we know the receivers at the end of the line of scrimmage are on the line of scrimmage. All right, going back to um, safety fouls. Block below the waist. Huge safety foul. Um, a lot of injuries happen and has happened um, for many years because there's so many blocks below the waist where even um, college has limited it to block below the waist and high school really limited um, block below the waist. But it's needed in football. Um, if I have a lineman who um, is 250 pounds, all right, 
and I have a defensive end who is 175 and really, really quick, we got to be able to get to that defensive end's legs to slow them down because otherwise they'll just run by me. Like, literally, they're that much faster than me. And vice versa, if I have an offensive lineman 175 pounds <laughs> and I have a defensive tackle 275 pounds, I don't want a 100-pound overweight person running me over every single play of the game. We have to allow that offensive line to take away the legs legally so they're not getting pounded all game long. So that's why the, the rule still is in play initially at the snap. So we're going to talk about high school first. The only time and only location a block below the waist is legal is we are in the free blocking zone, so five yards on either side of the ball, and both players are on the line of scrimmage. So they're within one yard of the line of scrimmage. And after the snap, they immediately go low. So it's got to be snap, I'm going down. It can't be snap, stand up, and then go down. There's no delay block in high school. Snap, go down to the ground, and block below the waist is legal. Immediately after snap, and both linemen have to be in the free blocking zone on the line of scrimmage at the snap. College, similar, uh, our same f philosophy with the offensive linemen, with the exception of in college, those linemen in now the, what we call the tackle box, if they remain in the tackle box and the ball's in the tackle box, now they can have that delay block below the waist if from the front. So they have to um, hit the legs in the front so they go straight back and not cut them in the side and go sideways and have some knee injuries. The other um, additional rule in college is the backs in the backfield. If they are stationary inside the tackle box, the ball remains inside the tackle box. These are the backs protecting the quarterback from getting sacked. They could block below the waist if it's from the front. So the defender has to see the block coming, and that offensive player has to block below the waist where their legs go straight out backwards, and again, not to the side and hurting those knees. Every other level, if you're outside the tackle box, outside the free blocking zone, you're not stationary, there's no blocking below the waist. It's just a dangerous play, and when you're in the open field, it's one-on-one, -on -one, mano y mano, may the best uh, person win when it comes to tackle or gaining the extra yard. Um, so blocking below the waist, this is, I'll, I'll put in the category, when in doubt, it's a foul. When in doubt, it's a foul because they, as in the players, need to do it 100% correct right away in the location and who they could do it um, to to prevent injury. Next safety foul, horse collar. All right, we as officials get yelled at because somebody grabs the nameplate, somebody grabs the back or inside part of the jersey, and they tug or they pull. That's not the foul. The foul is not the grab. The foul for horse collar comes, what do they do after the grab? If they pull abruptly backwards and take the ball carrier down, now we have a foul. We, we, we need that ball carrier who is being grabbed by the horse collar to the ground to be a foul. It, it, it's just not the grab and pull. It's the snap of the legs. And again, that's where the injury comes, is they are pulling so hard backwards that they are taking their legs and... Um, so, so to speak, changing the whole entire direction of the leg. So we don't want players to even reach for the horse collar. That leaves judgment out of all of it. But if a player does reach for the horse collar and pulls, stops, and continues to tackle in a traditional way, it is not a horse collar tackle. Um, we need a very strong, hard, abrupt um, movement backwards, and then subsequently 
pulled backwards and sidewards to the ground. Next one, blind side block. The definition of what blind side is the same in high school and college. The blind side in high school and college is a block that takes place outside the vision of the person being blocked. So there are times actually the block is in front, but the defender is looking at the ball carrier on the other side of their body. That is a blind side block because it is outside of their vision of the blocker. It's not where they're hit on their body. It's where are their eyes when the hit happens. So the definition of that is exactly the same high school and college. What is allowed to happen is completely different, though. In high school, if somebody blocks from the blind side, they must have hands open, arms extended. All right? I, I, always, when I, I always like giving solutions to coaches. What do I tell my kids? Well, what you got to tell your kids is you, you, you can't do the pushing motion. You, you, like, you can't declete them. You can't lead with the shoulder. You have to have two arms out, open hands, stopping and preventing of that defensive player running into your player. That's what you have to do to block from the blind side. The other thing you could do, this is a basketball thing, stand there and set a screen. If you stand there and set a screen, the offense is not initiating that block. The defender is running into you. I mean, that's not uh, fun to do. I, I, I get it. Um, but that is a solution that you can do. What I've seen the best, and, and this sort of works, uh, you see it a lot in college, and coaches are teaching this, it's, it's the flyby where they are literally running as fast as they can, as close as they can to the defensive player. And right at the last second, they raise their hand above their head and they fly by the defender. Because guess what the defender does? Stops and avoids contact. Because the defender does not want to run into that object. It's going to prevent them from getting that ball carrier. And that's all that's needed. You just need that defensive player to slow down just a little bit so that ball carrier could get to the edge. All right, so high school, blindside blocks legal? Yes, if it's open hands and extended arms. College, completely different threshold. The, the word that is needed for a foul for blindside block in college is attacking. If the officials deem the block beyond what is needed to block the opponent from the blind side, now we have a foul for illegal blind side block. Right, so they can go shoulder to the shoulder. They can be moving. They can lead with a forearm into the torso. Um, but what they cannot do is crouch, launch, um, declete their opponent just because they can. If in the official's judgment, the blocker is attacking the opponent outside their vision. Now we have an illegal blindside block. Um, on our YouTube channel, uh, we're, we're going to have about three or four examples, two high school, um, two college. And if you go back to Nebraska versus Wisconsin, there's an illegal blindside block that very clearly shows a player attacking another player outside the vision. Those are the fouls we need to get in college, the attacking ones. When in doubt, in both levels, high school and, and college, when it comes to illegal blindside blocks, since it's a, a safety foul, when in doubt, it is a foul. The next one is roughing. All right, so high school, a little tidbit here. There's only three fouls in high school that are automatic first downs. Roughing the snapper, roughing the holder, roughing the uh, passer, and roughing the kicker. Roughing, roughing, roughing are the only automatic foul, uh, automatic first downs um, in high school football. So we always get the complaint of why can't our kickers, why can't our passers be contacted like a ball carrier? Easy. They are vulnerable in the position they are at. So when they are contacted, it puts them at a very high safety level of being injured. So quarterback in a throwing posture, 
They have their feet spread out wide. They're outside their body frame, and it's opposite of where they're typically getting hit at. All right, so when a passer is passing the ball, their whole body is vulnerable. So they are going to have a different rule to protect their safety more than a ball carrier. A ball carrier sees the contact coming. A ball carrier's frame and balance is completely different than a, a, a passer. Same thing with a kicker. A kicker usually has one leg on the ground or no legs on the ground when they're contacted. A very vulnerable position um, to get injured with, with their leg um, positioning. So are we protecting the passers more than the ball carriers? I would argue no. We are protecting how that player posture is more than how a player's ball carrier's posture is more. So that's why roughing, um, stay off the quarterbacks, stay off the kickers, because it, it's, a, it's a play that we need to call to protect the safety, not only of that player, but future players that defender comes in contact with. Uh, so the big word for roughing is avoid. So roughing the passer. If that defender could avoid making contact with that passer, then they must avoid contact with making that passer. I'm a solution guy. Defender comes in, ball is thrown, two-hand push on the passer, passer goes to the ground. Is that a foul? Absolutely. Because I go up to the coach and say, Coach, would your defensive player ever push a ball carrier down to the ground like that to make a tackle? And the answer is no. So the defensive player had enough time to make the cognitive choice of push versus wrap up tackle. They had time to avoid contact on that passer. So if they don't attempt to avoid that passer, it's going to be a foul. My my threshold is going to change if that same defender does a wrap up tackle. So if I yell balls away and on the away, they do a two hand shove. I have a foul on the balls away on the, when I say the word away, they do a wrap-up tackle with their head to the side. That's exactly how they were going to tackle a ball carrier. Now I have a legal hit on that passer. It's just the passer got, it, got the pass away just in time. All right, so understand that, coaches and officials, the different thresholds there and why, yes, we are going to protect that passer because it doesn't take too much time to avoid contact of a player who is in a vulnerable position. The next thing with the, the roughing the kicker, the player is a ball carrier until the ball is kicked. All right, so if a defender is in the process of tackling the player with the ball and then all of a sudden the ball's kicked, that's not roughing the kicker because they went after that player as a ball carrier. All right, so coaches, teach your defenders. Go after a passer, go after a kicker as if they are a ball carrier. You, you are going to help prevent that roughing uh, foul going a little bit deeper into college rules with roughing the passer high hit on the passer automatic foul so here I am I'm going up with two hands because I want to block the pass I come down I miss the pass and I hit the passer in the head that's roughing the passer um, if I am trying to uh, tackle the ball carrier who is the passer but I make forcible contact at the knee or ankle that's roughing the passer you got to do the wrap-up tackle at the thigh, waist, uh, belly, armpit. Armpit to thigh is where the defenders have to um, hit the passer. And the last one is bringing all the body weight down on the passer. So cool. I hit them in the, in the torso, but now I'm driving them into the ground with all of my body weight as a defender. That is very unsafe. That's going to be a foul for roughing the passer on the defense. You have to roll tackle. You have to land on the side, have the quarterback or passer land on the side to avoid roughing the passer. Again, when in doubt, we are going to throw the flag for a safety foul roughing the passer. Coach, I know you don't like it this, the call this time, but I'm going to protect your passer the same exact way. There's a reason why they're starting quarterbacks, officials. Keep those players in the game. 
there are so many more fouls that we could go over um, on this podcast. And But we wanted to have the conversation started. I picked these fouls because these are the fouls that are most misunderstood or most criticized from coaches, players, and fans when officials do throw the flag for those fouls. Um, hopefully this podcast brings some more understanding um, and clarity and intent of the fouls of fairness versus safety of when officials do throw the flag versus when they don't throw the flag and why. Um, make sure you visit our, our YouTube channel. Um, we're going to be releasing uh, a bunch of plays via the reels and showing specific clips. This is a foul. This is why it's a foul. This is not a foul. This is why it's not a foul. 30 to 60 seconds a piece. Um, our goal is one or two a day throughout the season, uh, but it's timeout with PSOA at our YouTube live channel. For all of you that have listened to this podcast, um, please take time out. Listen to our previous podcast. Um, this is not just for football. This is for all sports officials on and off the field. This is for all coaches of what officials do, are told, are taught. And the more we players, we coaches, we officials have the same terminology and understanding of rules, mechanics, um, the more enjoyable the sporting event will be. So thank you for taking time out today with PSOA. Until our next uh, time together on our podcast, sports officials, remember, you're only as good as your last call. A Heard at Sports Network production.